Good evening and welcome everyone to the April 14, 2015 meeting of the Downers Grove Village Council. It is my privilege to call this meeting to order. If you haven't already done so, there are copies of our agenda on either side of the room. Please feel free to pick one up and you can follow along with our proceedings tonight. There will be multiple opportunities for public comment, both with respect to items that are on our agenda tonight, as well as a segment that we have at item 13 tonight that is reserved for public comments of a general nature with respect to things that are not on tonight's agenda. So those who are here to express any questions or comments of a general nature, item 13 is the one you want to look for. It is our uh, proud tradition to begin our meetings by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this point, I would like to ask everyone to please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge I allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd now like to ask our fine village clerk, April Holden, please call the roll. Commissioner Jose? Here. Commissioner Olson? Here. Commissioner Rankin? Here. Commissioner Barnett? Here. Commissioner Newstad? Here. Commissioner Durkin? Present. Mayor Tully? Here. Thank you very much. That brings us to item three, proclamations. I do have a proclamation to read tonight. Uh, this one is in the celebration and appreciation of the Spirit of Life Chorus. Proclamation reads as follows. Whereas Spirit of Life Chorus is a 75 plus member ecumenical Christian concert chorus, and whereas Spirit of Life Chorus performs in church sanctuaries and auditoriums throughout the Northern Illinois area, and whereas Spirit of Life Chorus was formed in 1989 with 17 charter members, and whereas Spirit of Life Chorus has grown to over 75 singers and musicians, and whereas the members of Spirit of Life Chorus have dedicated themselves to singing two concerts each year to benefit worthy organizations, causes, families, and individuals, and has helped raise in excess of $241,000 doing so. Whereas the members of the Spirit of Life Chorus cordially invite the community to their Downers Grove concert celebrating 25 years of spirit to be held on May 3rd, 2015 at Faith United Methodist Church, located here in Downers Grove at 432 59th Street at 4.30 p.m. You can hear a wide variety of spiritually uplifting patriotic music. Now, therefore, I, Martin T. Tully, Mayor of the Village of Downers Grove, do hereby proclaim Sunday, May 3rd, 2015, as the Spirit of Life Chorus Day in the Village of Downers Grove and congratulate them on their 25th anniversary and their many accomplishments. And uh, we have a couple of members here from the um, 75 plus members that I just mentioned, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Steer are in the audience, and I'd like them to step up and I can present them with this proclamation. Take your right up in front here. Oh, okay. <coughs> Star of Honor. Oh, oh thank you. <coughs> and this is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Mayor Tully and the entire Village Council and the Village of Downers Grove for this tremendous honor. We, uh, we have been singing in over 380 churches around the suburban areas, but we've been performing in Downers Grove at various churches over the years. And so this will be a treat to, to come back on May 3rd and uh, perform one more concert uh, for the benefit of all the people in the community. So we thank you very much. This is a tremendous honor. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here tonight. And good luck with the concert. We'll definitely try to attend if we can. Thank you. Thank you. It brings us to item four, which pertains to minutes of prior council meeting, minutes of prior council meetings. We have one set of minutes to approve tonight, and those are our regular council meeting minutes from our April 7, 2015 meeting. Uh, do any members of the Village Council have any questions, comments, changes, or corrections to those minutes? Seeing that there are none, uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Newstead? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. Those minutes are approved. Thank you very much. That brings us to item five, which is reserved for council member reports. This is an opportunity for members of the village council to share goings on in the community 
with those who are in the audience and watching at home or to share other items of interest. Uh, we'll go to my left this, this time and start with Commissioner Barnett. No report, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Olson? No report. Commissioner Neustadt? Uh, this Saturday on April 18th, there will be a village paper shredding event from 8 a.m. till noon right here at Village Hall uh, in the fenced-in lot off of Curtis Street. This free service is offered to Downers Grove residents in an effort to prevent identity theft. Uh, participants may be asked to show proof of Downers Grove residency. This is a great service that our village provides, and I'm glad to see that we're doing it again. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jose? No report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rankin? No report. Commissioner Durkin? I'm not breaking the trap. It's already been broken. <laughs> uh, there is one thing I just want to point out. Uh, our very own Lieutenant Jim Niels was honored on April 11th, 2015 at a um, Chicago Wolves hockey game as a hometown hero. Uh, probably if you were in attendance, you saw that. Uh, if not, I know there are some photos that are circulating around. So a shout out to Lieutenant Niels for being honored in that fashion. It's nice to see one of our own receive that kind of recognition. And, and I don't know if uh, the village manager wants to mention, uh, uh, which I just mentioned the police department, if you want to. There'll be some news coming up with right. our fire department on Thursday, so look for that. All right, very good. So there's a teaser for you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for that. And that's all I have to share at this point in time. Uh, that brings us to item seven is uh, the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments from any members of the audience with respect to any of the items on tonight's consent agenda? Any questions or comments from members of the Village Council? Hearing none, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Newstaff? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously. That brings us to item eight, our active agenda. We have a couple items on our active agenda tonight. First, do I have a motion to adopt an ordinance establishing a special service area, number eight, in the village of Downers Grove? So moved. Second. Are there any questions or comments from members of the audience? Questions or comments from members of the village council? May I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Newstead? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. That matter passes unanimously. It brings us to item eight, B as in boy. Do I have a motion to adopt an ordinance amending ordinance number 5346 and the Village of Downers Grove budget for fiscal year 2014? So moved. Second. Are there any questions or comments on this item from members of the audience? <coughs> questions or comments from members of the Village Council? Commissioner Jose. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, during the report uh, last week, uh, our Finance Director Judy Butney noticed, uh, noted that we came in um, within our budgeted expenses. I just wanted to note that uh, to be a little more specific, we came in under our budgeted expenses uh, by about $270,000. So uh, thanks to staff for uh, keeping costs in line, and I uh, hope we can do that in the future. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions or comments? Have a roll call, please. Commissioner Newstead? Aye. Commissioner Durkin? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Olson? Aye. Commissioner Rankin? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? All right, that matter passes unanimously and brings us to the end of our active agenda. That brings us to item nine, which is our first reading or our workshop agenda. Uh, this is an opportunity for staff to present something to the village council and the public for consideration <coughs> and discussion. No vote or other action will be taken at this time. Uh, it is traditional for uh, the village manager or his designees to introduce the matter. So at this point in time, I will turn over the item for presentation to our village manager, David Fieldman. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Uh, only one item on tonight's first reading agenda uh, considering adoption of the State of Illinois Plumbing Code with some amendments. And here to present background information on this item is our Building Division Manager, Alex Pelicano. Good evening, Mr. Pelicano. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Mr. Fieldman. Um, if I may provide a little background, the latest State of Illinois Plumbing Code became effective on April 14th of 2014. With these latest updates came the requirement to go through the Illinois Department of Health approval process for any proposed amendments. The IDPH made it clear that all amendments must be proven necessary with scientific or technical data as a means to combat a public health risk. The requirements rendered any existing amendments null and void until approval is obtained by the IDPH. In order to address the subsequent concerns of municipalities throughout the state, the IDPH conducted numerous town hall meetings to explain the requirements and process for approval. 
And to also remind communities this estate plumbing code is exempt from home rule powers to amend it by right. Over the past year, staff has attended the IDPH town hall meetings, consulted with our plumbing inspector on the various topics, discussed the impacts with our water department and the Downers Grove Sanitary District, and participated in discussions directly with the IDPH as well as neighboring communities. We reviewed our current amendments and determined that the two that are proposed in this ordinance are both necessary and have the highest likelihood of IDPH approval. The two amendments pertain to the following. One, requiring a greater installation depth for water service pipe and requiring the water meters to be installed within buildings. Both amendments are justified by the well-established deeper frost depths experienced in the northern portion of the state. They are intended to combat the likelihood of freezing and interrupting water service. As required, these amendments were submitted to the Department of Public Health for review, and we received tentative approval for them in March. If the ordinance is passed by this council, it must then be resubmitted to the IDPH for final approval. So at this time, staff recommends approval of this ordinance, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions or comments from members of the audience? Please, ma'am, come to the podium, and we'd welcome hearing from you. Good evening. Hi, Dave Bennett. Did I hear him say that water meters are going to be read in the basements again? His report? Is, is that what he said the new code is going to require? I don't, I don't recall him saying that. Where did he go? <laughs> <laughs> <There he is. laughs> no, the requirement is simply that the water meters be inside the building, the meters themselves, but the remote water meter readers would still be outside of the building. Thank you. That's nice to know. We were so counting on coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments from members of the audience? Thank you for that one. Any questions from members, Commissioner Rankin? Um, I just wanted to reinstate what uh, Manager Fieldman told me uh, yesterday, is that this isn't a new requirement um, that we're asking our plumbers to take on. It's, it's a practice that they generally do already, and we're not imposing new rules on them. Is that correct? You mean the entire code? In no, itself? no, I'm talking about this, these amendments that we're proposing. No, these are actually far less than the current amendments that we have on the books now. We analyzed each one of them and went through with our certified plumbing inspector, the water department, sanitary district, to ensure that all the ones that we were removing now were either addressed by the current code or had become outdated since the last plumbing code, which is over 10 years old. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Burnett. Um, not about the amendments because they make imminent sense, but I'm just wondering if um, we could get some response, um, Dave Enza Martin from uh, DMMC, on whether or not they have any plans to try and you know continuously work to change this back. Um, the, the fundamental concept that the state of Illinois and Springfield would uh, have better judgment about what plumbing codes ought to be in play in uh, you know, South Beloit and Cairo strikes me as borderline ridiculous. And to wit, you know, here in Downers with this new version, we now have a bunch of local amendments that this body and others before it for decades have felt were important and useful to the residents that are now just gone. Um, that strikes me as, I, I, I don't have any of the proper words for it. An erosion of local control? Uh, a lot more than that, Martin. Um, that, to be sure, it is that. Um, but I, I'd like to think that this would be yet another example um, of that that DMMC would be on because we clearly don't have the voice sufficient by ourselves to uh, to make a change but um, it is an erosion it's another step and and it's I, I just don't understand the concept if there's some big health public health problem out there that caused the state to feel they needed to exert this level of authority and control um, I'd love to hear what it is. If there was some big deficiency in plumbing codes across the state that made them feel like they really needed to be involved in deciding that they were all equal, I'd love to hear what that is. I, you know, suggesting that we have codes that are uniform, it sounds great, but, but to what end? Um, it's sort of the antithesis of the concept of lean. It's the antithesis of the concept of local control. Um, it takes the decision making for um, you know, forty thousand dollars Grove residents on on a, what should be a fairly straightforward and local matter, and, and just takes it out of our hands. I don't understand why, 
and I'd love to hear what our COG has to say about it and what they might be trying to do about it. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm sure you know that from your participation on the Legislative Committee at DMMC that one of the very tenets of the legislative agenda of DMMC now and for the last number of years has been to uh, oppose any unfunded mandates and also to uh, limit or reverse the erosion of local control, which you're absolutely right. That's a polite way to describe it. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, we'll be seeing something in the next couple of weeks here or so once we get a little more details from the governor's office in terms of uh, what kind of support he's looking for from municipalities. We don't have that yet, which is why it's not on tonight's agenda. Uh, but one of those tenants is exactly what you're talking about, Commissioner. Um, the other thing that I would add is that uh, in meeting with Governor Rahner himself, one of the things that he encouraged municipal leaders to do is to actually give specific descriptions of items that he could push for with the General Assembly in terms of either eliminating unfunded mandates or restoring local control and stopping the kind of things you're talking about. Um, I would um, um, welcome if you would put something together that I could then take back to DMMC and, okay. and specifically communicate to the governor's, um, I think it's either his legislative director or uh, director of government, I can't remember the exact title, but uh, Kyle, that's all I can remember. <laughs> We'll be happy to send it to him because we're actually soliciting those types of specifics. That was one of the things that the governor asked for. Cool. Um, and I, I, so please do, and I'll be happy to convey that uh, not only to the COG, but also to the governor's office itself. I'll get on it. Do we know what, what particularly drove this? Was there any particular instance that caused this to come forward? Actually, it was the myriad of municipalities throughout the state that have created their own sort of plumbing code. So that resulted in hundreds or thousands of different unique plumbing codes. And since the state actually licenses plumbers and creates the state code through the IDPH, they wanted to have more control over that so that their certified plumbers would have some consistency from community to community. We have similar, although probably not as broad, but similar situations relative to liquor, right? I mean, this is that preemption of home rule that's the part that I find so <coughs> offensive. We have, you know, the state licenses liquor license holders, um, and at the same time we have the ability to put local ordinances in play. Uh, that's the part that I feel like there's a big disconnect. So, all right, thank you. The only two qualifying things I would add is, is number one, we should probably quantify what the cost is and be able to measure that across numerous municipalities so that it has that weight of, not, as you said, not just one voice, uh, but also not, not undermining the importance of this issue, but there are a lot of these erosions of local control we'd like to see reversed. Uh, and so definitely we want to assess, the, the, assess all of them and figure out which ones uh, mean the most to the most municipalities so we can choose those as our as our uh, the, the point of the sword if you will but if you if you'll put that together i'd be happy to carry it forward okay thank you commissioner any other questions or comments from members of the council that ends our first reading tonight mayor thank you terrific thank you for that and uh that comes to item 10 on tonight's agenda which is the mayor's report um i have no items at this point in time so we're right back to you Mr. Fieldman for item 11, manager's report. Only one item on tonight's manager's report. It is a report and discussion and hopefully some direction from the council regarding our Clyde Estates project. Uh, and here to present information on this item is our public works director, Nan Newland. Good evening. Good evening. The purpose of this report is to review the design elements of the Clyde Estates subdivision improvement plans prior to the village advertising for bid. As a result of public input and council direction, the construction plans for Clyde Estates have been revised to eliminate the public sidewalks and the traffic circle, to revise the grading at the intersection of Washington, Webster, and 60th Place, and to raise ditch profiles as much as possible throughout the subdivision. <laughs> uh, the presentation will provide a summary of the key issues, which are street layout, drainage and ditches, and tree impacts. The overall project goals are to reconstruct the streets within the subdivision, improve drainage both for the street system and to benefit private property, to address resident concerns about traffic impacts, and to preserve as many parkway trees as possible while accomplishing this work. First, I'd like to focus on parkway tree impacts. Uh, this is a revised exhibit that shows the result of the tree impacts with these public sidewalks removed. This is for the grading work only. Um, the exhibit shows a location of approximately 17 potential tree conflicts shown in red where regrading is proposed. At each location, 
We will work with property owners as we have in projects in the past to determine if ditch grading can be adjusted to avoid removing trees. And in many areas, many of these trees shown in red are four inches or smaller, we are proposing to replant those trees on, at the same property. <clears throat> this exhibit shows the proposed road layout, um, the traffic circle at Washington 16th and Webster, as I said, was removed this, that, as the ex, uh, existing alignment there at that intersection. Uh, there's a large tree in that island that will be preserved. That'll still be a, a green grassed uh, triangular island. Um, the rest of the road system will remain essentially the same as the existing condition, except at the area of Wash where Washington Clyde and 60th place intersect. The plans including, include removing pavement at this low intersection and adding green space and helping to slow down traffic. That area was also regraded as part of the revised plans to save two large trees that currently exist in those grassed islands and those will be preserved with the revised grading. This is an enlargement of the um, intersection of Washington 60th and Webster. As you can see, it's staying the same as it is today. And this is an uh, enlargement of the intersection of Washington 60th and Webster, where we're revising the al roadway alignment. Switching to drainage, um, this is exhibit highlights the areas of drainage concerns in the neighborhood. And these locations were identified by residents at the neighborhood meetings and at follow-up meetings that staff had with residents at their homes and in the subdivision. I'll have a few photos to show what some of these look like a little bit further on in the presentation. Drainage is an integral element of the street system itself. Where water sits in the edge of streets or in parkways, the sub-base, the area under the surface of the pavement, that, which is the structural part of the road, becomes saturated with water. When it's saturated and it receives heavy loading like garbage trucks, causes the road to shift and that causes faster deterioration of the pavement. When it's saturated as well and we get freezing and thawing, it also causes the road to move, um, accelerating the, uh, the road um, deterioration. That's why it's very important that we provide some type of drainage for the street system to have a longer lasting um, result of the investment we make in the, in the reconstruction of the streets. As residents have mentioned in, in past meetings, Clyde Estate sits at the top of a watershed and doesn't receive a lot of water that drains through the subdivision, but it is a rather flat <coughs> terrain. And that is the purpose of providing drainage here, is to provide a place for the water that falls in Clyde Estates to be drained away and not to continue to sit in the right of way and in the parkways. And to provide an outlet for the water. And this, just to highlight that, this is a typical cross section of a pavement where there is no curb and gutter. So you see the ditch is lower than the aggregate or the base of the, of the street section. And that is on purpose to allow positive drainage away from the water that would be sitting in that gravel sub-base of the road and to provide a way for it to, for it to be drained away and not saturate that pavement. These are some photos that were taken in August in 2014 to show some areas that were identified as drainage problems within the right-of-way. I just have a couple here to show of soggy parkways. Um, Switching to the pavement, the existing pavement condition is beyond um, a condition where it can be uh, preventive maintenance, as, as you know, so we're redoing uh, reconstruction of the pavement. We have signs of base failure, especially in the areas that had poor drainage, and the pavement edge throughout the subdivision is deteriorating, as you'll see in a couple of photos we have here of the pa pavement condition along the edges. The alligator cracking, or the real fine cracking you see, is a, is a indicator of base failure. It's because the pavement is failing underneath um, the structural component of it. Again, more alligator cracking and saturated pavements. Deterior deteriorated edge lines as well. I'd like to switch over to talk a little bit about ditches. Um, I know that was a, a concern in the neighborhood. and. Um, this is um, a photo showing what we call a standard uh, ditch section. Let me see if I can get them both up here. Okay, here's a photo and a cross section. 
A standard ditch, ditch section we define where the slope coming on the side of each ditch is less than 25%, which is one foot vertical for four feet horizontal, and where the depth of the ditch is less than two and a half feet deep. That's a standard ditch section. With the plan revisions, the consultant was able to revise the plans to provide this standard ditch section in 87% of the ditch sections throughout the subdivision. Where there are trees, as you can see on the cross-section drawing there, we will work with property owners to understand their concerns. Where we have an obstacle like a tree or a utility or a power pole, we work with them to work on the, it's kind of a trade-off. Do we want to save the tree? Do we want to have a little bit steeper ditch sections to able to save the tree? So we work with residents as much as possible to understand what their um, pre preferences are. There are some trees some residents would as soon not have. Uh, they'd rather have gentler ditches. In some cases, they're willing to have a little bit steeper ditch in order to save trees. So we will be working with each resident as we go through those sections. This is the non-standard ditch, ditch section um, because it is over two and a half feet deep. Um, this occurs in some areas where we have limited um, space between the edge of the pavement and the property line. Um, where the ditch may be a little bit deeper. As I said, that is 13% um, or less of the ditch sections that we are working in in the subdivision. And lastly, this is uh, what we would call more of a constrained ditch section, as I said, where we have a utility, a power pole, a tree, where the um, steepness of the ditch may go up to as much as 3, 33% or three feet horizontal to one foot vertical in order to um, get past the obstruction or to save the tree. And as I said, um, this exhibit shows the areas of the subdivision where the blue is the standard ditch sections, which is 87% of the area. 13% um, of the area we show this non-standard or the slope between 33% and 25%. Uh, we uh, anticipate going out to bid in the next week or two and beginning construction by about the 4th of July, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So what we're hoping to do tonight is get some feedback from the council um, as far as, you know, is this the project you would like us to proceed to bidding or are there things you'd like us to consider changing? Uh, so we're here to answer questions and uh, happy to take any direction that the council may provide. Thank you. Since this is coming to us under the manager report, I'm going to uh, give the village council an opportunity to ask any questions of staff since we have a new well, I mean, a new configuration with some new information and a new configuration of that and that too and then open it up for public comment since I know there are a number of residents here who are in the audience uh, from Clyde country estates who obviously have been following this very closely um, but at this point I'll just ask if members of the council have any questions for staff Commissioner Olson. just a question on this proposed ditching uh, this not these non-standard ditch segments do you anticipate in these non-standard ditch segments that there will be there will be uh, grass covered or there I know there are some areas for example there's an area down the block from from me where there's a section that, that is rock mm -hmm. uh, because it's very steep uh, so it's very difficult was impossible to essentially to get grass to grow on that that steep predict. I don't believe we have any non-standard sections that are over three to one okay um, the throughout the community in the areas where we have rock sections is at the request of residents because of concerns with maintenance um, or where it might be a flatter line of the ditch where it might hold water um, so it's, it makes it an easier <coughs> maintenance approach right. but we don't anticipate that in this in this neighborhood thank you Commissioner Jose thank you mayor um, with regard to the ditches do we anticipate grass as we saw in these photographs or will there be other uh, plantings that will go in any of them? Well, right now we are working with the Diamond Grove Estate subdivision to put in bioswales uh, which have more native type plantings and do reduce, they provide water quality enhancements and they reduce maintenance and I think we'd be happy to work with this neighborhood once construction's done <coughs> if they would desire this type of treatment as well. Um, what kind of maintenance is necessary on those and, and that maintenance falls on to the, the homeowner that this ditch would be outside of, right? The bioswales? Yeah. Uh, as far as maintenance of the bioswales? Right. 
Um, I have Andy Sikich here. He's working right now with Downers Grove Estates. Would you like to provide a little more information about that? Hi there. Um, yeah, the, the bioswale program that we're doing in Downers River Estates, which is starting at this spring, we've actually already reached out to some of the residents in Clyde Estates to see who would be interested in this kind of a program. There are several residents out here who are interested in having a bioswale. The program is basically the homeowner agrees to maintain it after we plant it and establish it. So we'll plant it, we'll do some maintenance on it for the first year or so. Once the plantings are established, then the homeowner would take over from there. Generally, the bioswale plantings are native. They take a lot less maintenance. Uh, and frankly, when you've got a ditch that, uh, you know, people don't, don't like to mow ditches, um, the bioswale plantings are, are a great way to go. They're great for water quality and infiltration. So that's a program that we are planning on implementing here as well. It's, it's, a, it's an honor system program, though. So we'll plant it. They maintain it. At some point in the future, if they decide to put it back to grass, you know, we're not going to uh, hold their feet to the fire on that. But... Uh, we don't anticipate that happening very often. So how, how tall can some of these native plantings get? Are we talking a foot, a couple of feet? Uh, how, how big can they get? We've generally selected plants for these kind of bioswales that are shorter. So you're not going to get the five, six foot prairie grasses that people are familiar with. The, the tallest plants are going to probably be in the range of 30 inches, something like that. Okay. I'm just thinking about sight lines, rounding corners, things like that. Yeah, that's why we, that's why we kept them short. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the, uh, if anybody else has anything for Andy, or is yours? Stop. Um, just switching back now to the ditches and um, you know more of the grading of them. If we were to take the 13 percent that are non-standard and make them standard instead of non-standard, what would be the effect on the the stormwater uh, drainage, the life of the road, and that sort of thing? Um, I'm, I'm not really sure we could do that. Uh, the reason they're non-standard, and, and none of these ditches are what I would call extreme, like the ones you're talking about with the rock in them and those kind of things. They're just a little bit deeper, a little bit steeper than a standard ditch. Um, they're generally, if, if, if you can kind of, the, the top, the center of the subdivision is the high spot, and the water flows to the north and then to the south and the, and the west. So they're sort of at the downstream end of these ditch sections. That's why they're a little bit deeper, because the, the ground's generally pretty flat. So as the ditch has to slope downward, they get a little bit deeper towards the end. So really, I think what, what the effect would be is we would have to add quite a bit more storm sewer, uh, which would add uh, quite a bit of cost to the project. Um, and we'd have to talk to the consultant to make sure that would even be feasible, but that's kind of my thoughts. Okay. And what is the expected life of the road under this current design? Expected life of a road like this under normal maintenance could last 100 years, so like a standard, uh, standard road will. Resurfacing, with resurfacing, with resurfacing, but the base would last you know, a period of time. So, so let's take a minute to understand that because I heard some comments from the residents there. Uh, what we mean by how long would a street last with normal maintenance, uh, we heard 100 years, and that's expected if properly constructed from the get-go with the proper drainage, and then periodic maintenance. Uh, a couple of years in after the reconstruction, you're talking about sealing the cracks in the, in the surface level, the asphalt crack sealing. Then around the 10-year mark, you're talking about milling off the surface, the top of the asphalt, and, and resurfacing it, and having that repeat on that cycle over and over and over. And what we're talking about is potentially 10, 10-year 10 cycles before it would have to be reconstructed at all. So I was listening to Mr. Sigich, uh, the uh, budget reports from a couple years ago where I learned that. Uh, but what we've seen since we've adopted that approach in the last couple of years uh, is that it, it truly is extending the life of our road system um, and we are committed to that kind of maintenance so we don't have this uh, sort of situation where these roads failed, uh, what was the subdivision, in the 50s or the 60s, so in that time frame. So I guess my final question would be, if we didn't institute also these drainage improvements, what would be the shortening of the life cycle of the road? Ballpark, I'm not going to hold you to it. Chances are I won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> It's, what, 50 or 60 years old now, so I would assume it'd be about the same. You'd see about the same performance if we left it the same as it is. Generally, you'd see much higher resurfacing costs as well because as the base fails, you need to do a lot more patching and that kind of thing before you resurface. So it would increase that quite a bit. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions? 
staff from Council Commissioner Dirk. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine with this. I think in light of the fact that the sidewalks have been removed at the request of the residents, I think this is a fair uh, uh, project with all the right components that have been addressed and brought to our attention by the residents. So I'd be in support of this. Commissioner Barnett. Nan, maybe I didn't hear correctly, so help me. At the very beginning, did you say that, that the tree layout was mostly what you expected, but there were still places where you were working with residents to figure out exactly what was going to happen in those parkways? Yes. Um, many of the trees that we showed in red, I think there's 17 or 18 of them, are mm -hmm. four inches or smaller. Mm -hmm. So those, we will work with residents to transplant those. And as we work through the areas, we will, just like we do every year, with the, have done with the sidewalk program, we will lay it out and we will look at the grading and we'll work, talk with the resident out there and see if we were to save this tree, this is what the slope would have to be if we're going by a tree with a ditch. And we'll talk about what that slope would be like and, and um, talk with the resident about that. Do you have any reason to believe that, I mean, you mentioned three to one, that grass won't be sustainable on any of these ditches? I don't think we've seen a problem with three to one slopes with grass. That's, I'm just, that's a, if we are able to maintain grass cover on the ditches, then it's pretty hard to even see four to one versus three to one. If we, if three to one is enough that we lose grass cover, then it becomes a huge aesthetic issue. That's why I'm concerned about it. Well, there are some trees we won't be able to avoid just because of where they're located and the resulting slopes that there would be. But we, we do look at each one in detail and just don't go by the plans. Does, um, <coughs> would, one of the things that, that's a challenge for us is edge, street edges. That's where we start to fail all the time. Would we get any benefit from ribbon curbs? as it relates to drainage? Does it allow us more flexibility on the drainage? Does it allow, does it help hold stuff a little tighter so your drainage can be not quite as good and you'll still extend lifespan? Well, it's the cost. I mean, we've done, we did that, was it on Woodward many years ago? Is that Woodward we did as a trial okay. project? Um, I mean, it's really, and what we've been doing through subdivisions is where, or, I'm sorry, through road maintenance projects where we need to put in ribbon curbs we have. Um, but it's really, a, the cost is really the consideration when it comes to putting in the, the ribbon curbs. It's my understanding it would provide those benefits that you spoke of. It's just a cost-benefit analysis. I, I'm just trying to, you know, balance things out here. We're trying to avoid trees. We'd like to preserve the trees, and we'd at the same time like to not have ditches. Those are in conflict if we're trying to preserve the road surface. And so that's why I've asked the question. Commissioner Staff. More of a comment. I, I've heard this probably 15 times, work with residents about trees, about ditches, about bioswales. I mean, this is a project that in Downers Grove is a community project where everybody works together. We've already talked about sidewalks in this neighborhood. Now we're talking about bioswales, ditches, ditch material, trees, depth of ditches. I think that the amount of scrutiny that this project gets is the Downers Grove way at its best. Um, many communities all around would have had two weeks and this project would have been approved, um, whether the residents liked it or not. This community, this organization goes out of their way to listen to the residents and try to work with them. And it's gonna continue as this project goes forward. So thank you to the staff members that will be out in the field, looking at trees, bringing their levels to the ditches and trying to make this work for everybody. It's, it's a hard job, it's a big job and I appreciate the hard work. I support the ditches as they are I think it's important to make the ditch system work so the roadway doesn't crumble earlier than it should. And uh, as far as the concrete ribbons go, I think we did that on Brookbank. That was a few years back, so we don't really have that much data to go on to see if how much better it makes the roads last. But I think uh, in this particular case, the cost benefit is best to have the right size ditches and the road reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions from members of the council? Uh, Actually, two questions I had, Commissioner Jose already asked, um, and Commissioner Barnett touched upon the other issue, which is this this is a balance. Uh, it's like a three sided teeter totter. You can't quite get everything you want uh, without sacrificing something else. Um, so it's a bit of a balancing act. Uh, I think it's about as balanced as it's going to get unless we start tipping it over to the cost side or one way or the other. 
uh, obviously road maintenance is a huge deal and it's a very expensive deal. I mean, the road project here, let's not lose sight of how much the, the road project is, is costing. And for that to fail 50 years or 20 years earlier than it otherwise would uh, is some real money. So yeah, yeah it, 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 is a, it is a balancing act. Um, one quick question I had, just kind of on topic. Um, I know the bids are going out and, and we, we'll vote on a contract once the bids come back. So that's when we'll have a first reading and a vote on this again. Um, I remember that we were gonna have another neighborhood meeting. And yes. was that supposed to take place? That would be before we go out for bid to have the opportunity to go over with the residents the final plans. Okay. Do we, is there a date set for that yet or that's not determined? We'll know if uh, you tell us this is the project and then we can <laughs> start enough. putting dates uh, on it. Understood. That, that's, that's all I had. Um, I'll open it up then to members of the audience. I know there's a number of residents from this subdivision who are here tonight who have been following this pretty closely. Good evening. Good evening. John Poliska, 6016 Washington. Could you go to that slide that shows the section through the roadway? Uh, I, I'm not sure what I'm seeing up here. I'll explain what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, it appears that I'm looking at the as-built existing road construction right now with new ditch profiles. Uh, the tan part would be clay, which doesn't uh, really drain well. What is shown as aggregate base, unless the scope of the project has changed, is going to be uh, a type of concrete, because it's full depth reclamation, meaning that it'll be there'll be no more aggregate there. It'll be a uh, mixture of Portland cement, the present aggregate and water to form concrete. So there's not gonna be any drainage there. So I, I'm not sure what that slide is supposed to represent. The, the other question I have is on uh, the photographs showing the uh, water I would, I would imagine that that photograph was taken after a significant storm event, not just the, like the rain we had last week. I believe that was the... August 2014. Yes. Okay. So, and the other question I have, and I'm just throwing this out, maybe it'll come up at a better time during budgeting. Um, you're probably talking about a eighty to $100,000 for bioswales and uh, that wouldn't happen till next year. It may be something you would be considering eliminating to save money. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Other questions, comments from the audience? Good evening. One white haired lady to another. Well, we can flip a coin. One white-haired lady to another. Um, I'm Connie Butler, live at 5925 Washington, just off of 59th. I have uh, five questions. One, um, if you can tell me, what is the reason for the rationale for the reconstruction of the street in Clyde? I think it's because they're failing, or failed. No, no, the reconstruction of the, I'm sorry, the intersection. What is the, um, the rationale for the uh, reconstruction of the intersection? We can, we can go over that again. If, uh, would, you, would, would you mind reminding us? That was a result of input that was received at the uh, first and second neighborhood meeting where there was concern about traffic speed and cut through traffic um, between 59th Street and Main Street, and it was a way to help to uh, provide traffic calming. <clears throat> Thank you, Neil. So the intersection, um, I don't know if there's a slide that shows it, what that will be doing will be removing two of the three streets. One of those streets is the walkway, there's not many cars that go there, is the walkway between 60th Place and Washington Street. 
So now, where are kids who live on 60th or adults or a lady that I saw walking the other day when I was uh, observing, walking from 60th around the corner to visit somebody in Washington, where will they walk now? Okay, when you just realize you're removing two of the three streets. I, more importantly, the neighborhood wanted all the sidewalks taken out. I'm sorry? So more importantly, the neighborhood asked for the sidewalks to be removed. No, no, I'm talking about where are the people going to, how are the kids going to walk from 60th to go to Fairmont School and O'Neill and why? How are they going to do that? I, are they going to go out onto Main Street? Or are they going to have to then walk all the way down to this intersection, all the way down? And you know kids aren't going to do that. Anyway, that's just so you're aware that you're cutting off the access from one street in Downers Grove, a uh, cloud estates, to the rest of the community. J just so you're aware of that. The um, are you are you saying you may want sidewalks now? No, that, you're you're cutting off a street. That's a lane. That's where people walk on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's no. But now there's no place to walk. Okay. You're, you're cutting I, out that. I'm really not, I'm not you're making it. You're, you're making you this. Lead, you're making this right, green right, area. You can still go around. You can still go around. You can still the get through. It's just moved. It's not blocked off. Okay. When we have another discussion, I'll draw. I'll draw a map. Okay. I, I'm. Right okay. Here. I'm looking right at it. Right here. Okay. How far are you going to have to walk? Well, yes, you do have to walk a little, a little bit different than you did before, but you can still get through. It's not blocked off. You can still traverse the neighborhood. It's just you'd have to take a slightly different route than previous. Right, you cannot directly walk from 60th place you, now. You have to go maybe to, 50 feet out of the way you used to before. Yes, you're correct. Right, okay. But we're not blocking off access to the neighborhood. Okay. Now, I what, what I understand is that area where the streets are going to be removed is going to be a water management retention area. Is that correct? And what what are we what are we managing? Because we're talking about this is the the top of the watershed where there is no flooding. And so, in a conversation that we had, uh, B and I had with a member of the. Uh, department uh, this last week saying that what they're going to do now is build a ditch, a big ditch, wide ditch, tall ditch, uh, deep ditch, and they're going to put up grasses that are higher than uh, people are. And so you're changing the whole dynamics of this grassy area, and now you're putting up these great big things um, that are going to be ground, brown, so all you you know, for six months out of the year, they're going to be brown. Um, so, so we're changing the, uh, the Clyde Estates, okay? We want you to fix the roads. We want you to help with the drainage, okay? The, um, the other thing is the, uh, the, the flooding, I, I certainly concur with, it's a long Clyde circle over by the Y field. That flooding lasts when you have a big big rain, like we did a couple days ago. I, I made a point to drive it uh, two days in a row. And it takes about two days for that to dissipate. In the meantime, you've got a significant part of the yard underwater. Fortunately, the yards are so big there that they're not, they're not threatening the house, okay? Now, if you have storm after storm after storm, then that could be more problematic. So I, I, I certainly concur with the village and congratulate you on trying to do something about that. The question is, where is that going to go? Now, what we understood is that's going to go, because that's the low part, you can't send it up to the water management area, which is high part unless you have a motor, I guess. Uh, to send the water. So it's going to go to a sewer. It's going to go down towards other homes, which would be towards 59th, okay? So I'd be really interested in knowing more specifics about how is the drainage along that Clyde Circle really going to be handled? 
And where's it? Where's it going? I don't know if that's possible to answer that question or not. Probably not in the few minutes that we have at this moment. Okay. There, if you want, we could probably show you the uh, topographical that shows the elevations if you'd like. Well, you know, the low part, they, they're evidently is, is their plans are for, as I understand, that the drainage for the low part is going to go, keep on going down in that area <coughs> straight towards 59th. Right. It's nothing to do with the water retention area, which is on the high part where they're going to create a ditch and put these things in. So, um, so anyway, I, again, I commend you. This is a huge project. I commend you for trying to tie all these pieces together. It just makes me nervous about um, some of the things that aren't mentioned and we hear about, kind of. And I'm so thankful for another public meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Butler. I just wanted to clear up some maybe misconceptions about the stormwater area. We're not detaining water here. Um, it was uh, greatly, uh, the depth of it was reduced. That was another change that was made with the plans. Um, it's really more of a kind of a water quality feature. Water will drain through this area. There will not be a, a defined ditch. There's not going to be any tall plantings like Andy mentioned before. Um, it will all be keeping in nature with the subdivision and um, lower plantings and uh, more sl gentle slopes. The grades were changed in order to preserve the two trees, so the um, depth of it was significantly reduced from the original plan. And we'd be happy to share more details about that when the residents, when we sit down with them. And, and generally speaking, could you just walk us through sort of where the crown of this subdivision is and where the water drains to and from? Sure. I'd be happy to have Andy explain that. <laughs> He's much more familiar with the detailed drainage than I am. Yeah, without getting into specifics, just in general, the, the high point of the subdivision is roughly through the middle of it. And about the north half of it flows to St. Joe's north. The south half of it flows to St. Joe's south. So it flows to 59th and it flows south to 61st and then Maine. That's kind of how the drainage works. Thanks, Ian. Uh, before you, um, could you also, Mr. Polifka was asking a question about the drawing of the street. Can you explain that again? To make sure that we're providing enough, enough information about that. Sorry, Mike. So what this shows is, is just a typical cross section of a street that doesn't have curb and gutter. So what you're seeing on the sides, those little V's on the sides, those are the ditches. So you're looking at it as a cross section through the street. So those ditches show that you can see the ditch bottom is just slightly below the road base. And that's where you want it, because then the road, the water can get into those ditches, whether it goes over land or soaks through the ground, and flow away from the road to keep the water out of that pavement base. That's pretty much all this cross-section is depicting. And what are the materials, Andy, generally speaking? Generally speaking, that where it says aggregate there, that's, that's the, the ground-up old road, the aggregate of the old road mixed with cement. So that's a fairly hard, but not, not concrete-like, but it's a fairly hard substance. And then the top is going to be asphalt. What kind of subgrades do we have in these areas? Uh, they're clay subgrades, like, like we have everywhere. Thank you. So you're saying that that tan, British tan area, that's going to be clay natural product, or is that? The sub base out there right now is clay. The ditches will have topsoil in them. This isn't that detailed, okay. but the ditches will have topsoil, and then they'll either be grass or biosoils, depending on what the resident wanted. And that's four inches of black top or eight inches of black top. Uh, for the road? For the road I, uh, I'm not, I think it's three. I'd have to look at the plans. I think it's okay. three inches. Okay. Um, it's a very it's a standard road. Yeah, but that when we do the FDR, that pavement base is very strong. So you okay. get a very strong road out of it. Because of the aggregate. And the cement that we put in the aggregate. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to, this question has come up, it seems a, probably a couple dozen times at this point. Why is it that the that water uh, management area has been proposed for that location, and what is the benefit of putting it? Could you give me a, a synopsis on that? Well, as you saw from some of the photos, when it rains hard, there's areas that pond. Um, in addition, in areas like this where you have storm sewer and you have a bunch of green grass flowing into your, your uh, creek system, ultimately, you get very poor water quality. 
So when you take an area like this and you add um, soil that's got sand and topsoil in it that helps absorb rainwater, and the native plants also help uptake a lot of those nutrients that would otherwise just go right downstream into the creek. So while it's not a big detention basin, it is going to help a little bit with, uh, with attenuating runoff and with water quality. That's really the purpose of it. And, you know, again, this will be planted with similar plantings to the bow swales, so they're not going to be six-foot tall grasses. They're going to be the shorter prairie grass and flowers. These are the types of improvements that are required in some cases and recommended in, in all cases under the uh, Clean Water Act and our NPDES permits that we've talked about on and off for, for many years. So when we have the opportunity like this where water's flowing through as part of a drainage system and we have open green space that's owned and controlled by the village, it makes sense to put those types of improvements right in that drainage line. So that's, that's why it's there and those are the benefits it provides. Can you quantify for me the amount of the neighborhood that drains into that watershed or that water management area? I'm not off the top of my head, no. Can we get that at some point? Mm -hmm. I mean, just to give me an idea. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hey, you're being hard to hear. Hey, you? That's really well, he's not saying anything right now. That's probably why. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'll ask him to speak up when he speaks again. That, that's the first time anybody's ever said that to me, so I'll make a point of speaking even louder. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Logan, Ms. Bennett. I have a question. I'm not prepared, and I wonder why. I was, uh, I was surprised that we're going to have this discussion tonight. Um, on April 1st, I issued a Freedom of Information Act, and I just got the reply yesterday in the mail. So that was 14 days turnaround. And yes, the village postmarked it uh, the 8th. I think the turnaround is five, plus, five days plus uh, working days, five working days. So I should have had it by the 7th. Anyway, I got it yes, yesterday, so that was the 13th. And it was a lot to read, and I'm not familiar with a lot of, uh, a lot of the terms that I used in these technical drawings. So I would like to ask for time to study this and possibly even a dictionary to understand what I'm looking at. But I do know that on Friday, uh, Ms. Butler and myself met with the project manager, and it was a very windy day. And I had three specific questions that are still unanswered. One is how deep the ditches are going to be. And I heard Ms. Newland say uh, something that, again, I don't understand. Four to three or one, point, one to four? It's a ratio. It's a ratio, but I, it's not a figure that I'm common with. I don't know how deep the uh, ditches are going to be in front of my property. I don't know how wide they're going to be. The project manager said, don't worry, it's going to be a, just a gentle slope. Well, I don't know exactly how deep a gentle slope is, and it's important to me. I asked him, I would like to point out something, uh, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, I'm going to have ditches on both sides of my driveway, but I'm also going to have a lopsided driveway. On one side, I'm going to have three feet at it, and on the other side, I'm going to have 10 feet. And I don't know how I'm going to get in and out of my driveway, because if I overshoot, I'll end up in the retention pond. And that's important. When there's snow, that snow this year, was over my knees, so what is that? I don't know how deep that is. But if I'm backing out, I don't know how I'm going to do that with, with snow. And I'd like to be able to use my car. So, right. so I, I'm asking for some time to study this. Plus, it doesn't really show on that um, without a, a cursor or something to, to show you what I'm talking about. But I'm also going to get 20 more, 24 more feet. So my, ex my easement from the ditch, which I will be invited to maintain, 
will be about 50 feet. And there's no way I want to go out and weed 50 feet. So if that's something I'm going to have to accept, I, I, I really would like you to give me some time to figure out how I can do this. So don't go out for bids when there are so many gray areas that need to be addressed. It's just plain courtesy. You have given these professionals time to give a very detailed presentation with all the facts at their fingertips. I don't have that advantage, and I'm just paying the bill. So again, please consider giving me some time. Thank you. Mayor, we'll be happy to meet with Ms. Bennett on as many occasions as necessary to make sure we're on the same understanding and we'll try to express those concerns uh, and answers those questions in layperson's terms. And I, I think we've made a, a great leap forward here in trying to express graphically and in terms that most of us can understand. So all the areas in blue have ditches that are proposed to be two and a half feet deep or less. So from the top of the ditch to the bottom, a maximum of two and a half feet. So that tells you how deep the ditches would be. Now the ratio explains uh, how much rise or how much it would go up compared to how far it moves over or the run. And so what we're talking about here is for every foot of vertical change, it would be over a four foot stretch of horizontal change, which is a 25% slope. And we've actually provided some pictures for everybody of what those slopes actually look like in the field and we'd be happy to go on a little tour with uh, Ms. Bennett and any resident uh, just over to Downers Grove Estates where we can provide in the field examples of all the ditches uh, and types that would be uh, constructed here in Clyde Country Estates. Thank you. Could I respond? I really, ma'am, there wasn't anything to respond to. He was simply responding to your point about showing you the actual ditch so you can see for yourself what it's going to look like. I was out looking at various um, retention ponds or solutions to storm water. And what I found was appalling. And again, I have not prepared for this, but I do have photographs that I think each one of you on this council as homeowners or residents of this area would be very interested in seeing if you will give me time to, to find out how to put them in a little in, into a computer where it can be projected. I don't know how to do that. But I would like you to see it because I think you'd like to make uh, an educated decision before you go forward. So again, and I'd like to make one more comment. It was pointed out that uh, there will be ditches on both sides of the street. And uh, John Polifka pointed out that that's impervious materials under that pavement. That pavement, as I recall, was last maintained 29 years ago. And what they show in this attachment that there's cracking or alligatoring or whatever they used, uh, that has not been retopped in 29 years to the best of my knowledge. So again, this street, this whole area has been neglected. And for you to say that we cannot afford to have drain tiles, I think, I think that's being very cheap for <laughs> the poor maintenance you've given us in the past, and it's not funny. So thank you again. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Bennett. Good evening. Good evening, Marl Bowen, 829 Clyde Drive. Um, there's so many issues here. Uh, the excuse for the redesign of our roadway that you gave to Mrs. Butler was that uh, the community meeting that you had, people commented on traffic. Well, to my knowledge, we've never gotten a survey for the residents uh, in the 65 homes in Clyde Estates asking us um, any of these issues. Uh, I don't think that we've gotten any of these pictures mailed to our homes so that I know that no one else except for a few of us have access to these diagrams. Mr. Fieldman, you mentioned that you have put all those pictures out there. That's why we want meetings with our neighbors so that we can ask questions and understand the diagrams that I can't see from back here. And I don't know 
where this street goes and what the blue lines mean and the uh, graphs that you have in there as well. So one-on-one -on -one isn't going to do it because we all have questions about our neighborhood and not everyone can walk around a neighborhood at the same time. And the, um, the scope, if you had been at the meeting that we had in August and in November, you would understand that there were no surveys taken, there were no questions with the majority hands, hands up, except for no one wanted sidewalks. And it was a bunch of blueprints on tables scattered around the back of the room and a bunch of people trying to find their house and what the blueprint looked like. There, there was no professional presentation. You probably, the management here probably knows more than we know about the facts and figures. Um, I asked for the consideration of two signs to be put, one at Clyde and 59th Street and one at Main Street, strictly eliminating traffic between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. There's one at Blanchard and Maine, there's one at Kenyon and Maine, there's one at Ogden and Washington. That would simplify everything because you have not even provided me with a traffic study that I've asked for to show that we have traffic. Everybody in their neighborhood is going to say they have a lot of traffic. People drive too fast. If you don't have any research that backs that up, you can't tell me that that justifies this humongous rede redesign of our entire streetway. The crested road all the roadways are crested so the road so the water runs off the roadways so we have a ditch in our front yard because it's sunk because the tiles have sunk throughout the 50 or so years that it's been there and i think my husband tells me that it's at least two and a half feet deep because he mows it all the time and i weed it um, but tom topor and your engineering department tells me that we're going to get it deeper but if we don't have curbs and gutters. The water already runs off the road into our yard, and especially when it has a lot of rain. That's why you see the water in the yards that you've seen pictures of, because it goes off the road into the yards. Um, and part of the problem is that the roadway has not been maintained as we've been told by Public Works when I went to the budget meeting that we maintain them on a regular basis so they don't have to be rebuilt. Um, I want to be assured by this council and this public works department and all the people that create these contracts with the contractors that we can be assured that the quality of this roadway that you put in will not crumble and crack in a couple years. 59th Street was put in. There was no compaction study done on that roadway from Dunham all the way to Fairview. There were already cracks there. A couple years after, I was calling Public Works, asking them, well, when are you going to seal it? Well, we only seal it at a certain number of years. Well, you got to seal it now because there's cracks there. So if you put uh, low quality material in there because you're cutting corners, how do we get the contractors to assure us that we're going to get the top quality so we don't have to worry about it cracking in a few years because the garbage trucks come through every year, every week? Um, the ditches are supposedly going to remove, according to the plan that I saw, at least 14 trees. Uh, the council was kind enough to decide on our behalf that we were not going to remove the triangles in the Clyde Estates because we wanted to save the three mature trees there. But now we have at least 14 trees that the village taxpayers have paid for and we've cared for in our yards and liked to have there. Uh, if we are going to lose those trees just because we're digging ditches. That doesn't seem like uh, that's a real good idea. It doesn't make sense. I called Morton Arboretum and they told me that a mature tree can drink up to 100 gallons of water a day. Um, and they also cited the bald cypress, which we have three of, which is on the plan, and I think that's on the plan to be removed. They're all in the same yard on Washington. And the red maple, which is in our yard. It's a part, they're all parkway trees. Those are especially big drinkers. So I don't want to lose my tree, and I don't want to lose the, the, any of these parkway trees because you want to put ditches in our yards. And the, um, I just think we need another neighborhood meeting 
before these bids go out. And I would request that it be held here at the Village Hall so that we have a podium and we have projectors and we are able to put up things on the walls to show people what, what we're going to be stuck with. And if there's any way that we can uh, talk about that. In, uh, now, the tiles that B was just talking about, the drain tiles, it looks like you have a bid up here or a, I don't know what this paper's called that you have out here on the, on the, that we just picked up. I don't know what those papers are called. What are they, billings that you're going to be approving today? Can, can somebody please tell me? Hand, hmm? can't, can't answer your question. I can't see what's in your hand. The papers. Yeah, thank you. Excuse me? The staff, staff report. report. Well, each sheet um, is giving money to contractors. And I noticed that you have one in here for a company that is going to be doing drain tiles. Is that for Clyde Estates? Because if it is, and it can be, because we have, I have drain tiles in our yard. I'd like them to be replaced instead of a ditch. If the water is going to lay in my front yard because you're digging a ditch deeper in my yard than it already is, where is it going to go? Are you going to pump it someplace? That's how it's, is that how it's going to get to the big hole that you're going to create in between the two triangles where you're closing the road? Because that's uphill from where I live. And the water doesn't go that way. The pictures you see on the screen, folks, is east of where that hole is going to be. It's east of Washington. It's close to where the Y is. It's the circle where I live. That's where the water is collecting. There's no way you can get it to go uphill to that hole and go in there. So why are you putting the hole in there? I think we actually covered that a few minutes ago. But it's been explained that we're going to put natural growth in there and it's going to be water collection. But there's no water collected there because it doesn't go there. There's no water that collects I, I there. I don't think anyone's disagreeing with you on that. It's for water quality issues. It's not for detention. Water quality yes. issues. Water we, don't, quality. we don't have, we don't Please, use do well we water. Clean water Act. We're not using our well water here. No, we can't. Right. That's the, so why are we worried thing. about the water that's going into the ground for our trees? Because it goes in the streams. We don't, we don't have a stream there. It all ends up in the We're flat. And Mrs. Newland just here. told everyone we're flat there. It goes down underground to our trees <laughs> and to the, the deep wells that we don't use. <laughs> but we, we can't use them this call. Thank you for your comments. <sighs> Anyone else who hasn't spoken would like to speak on the ditch plan in Clyde Estates? Any final comments from members of the council, Commissioner Jose? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one other question for staff. If you, uh, and Ms. Bowen's comments um, kind of sparked this with me. I'm wondering how long the Clyde Estates roadway uh, or the roadways uh, have been in a failed condition. Oh, it's been several years. We can get you an exact date, but um, you know I've been working here for about a decade, and they had some challenges even as long ago as a decade. Uh, you may recall that at a certain point, you know, when we all recognized that our maintenance activities were not meeting our expectations, we went through and assessed the condition of every street segment in the village. And for those that were in a condition that could be maintained through regular maintenance, we started to focus on those streets doing regular maintenance on those as a way to preserve them and avoid reconstruction. That was the lowest cost life cycle maintenance we could do on those streets. We had a several street segments in the village that were to the point that they've already failed to the point that they would have to be reconstructed. We took that group of street segments and put them in a different priority category. And so while we were working through our list of priorities, the streets that had previously been determined that they needed to be reconstructed were not maintained because that would be throwing good money after bad, basically, right? We would be losing. It would not be pertinent to do so. So a couple years ago, we set out to reconstruct several subdivisions worth of streets that had failed. Clyde Country Estates is part of that. So yes, the residents are correct. There was a long time with inadequate maintenance. Yes, we knew they had failed several years ago. Yes, we had maintained other streets in lieu of maintaining these streets because we knew they were too far gone. And yes, we're adhering to a multi-year plan to lower the overall cost of maintaining these streets by reconstructing them now in this manner. 
Very good. Thanks, Mayor. All right, thank you. Well, I think we need some direction. I heard a number of uh, council members say they were okay proceeding with what's uh, before us for the bids. Obviously, there will be uh, a first reading in a neighborhood meeting before any contracts are voted on. Uh, does anyone disagree? Mayor, I, I just heard some requests from the, from the neighbors that there be the neighborhood meeting before the bids go out. Yes. Is that, a pos is that possible to have the neighborhood meeting before uh, we go out for bid? Yes, that is the plan. Okay. I, that's what I'd like the neighborhood meeting to be before we ought to bid, but I'm good with that. I'm, I'm, no, I'm fine with this. I just wanted to point out the process would still be uh, contract approval at some point right. by this body. So the going out to bid doesn't kick off any digging in the dirt. That's correct. There'll be this direction provided here tonight, then we'll prepare uh, for the upcoming neighborhood meeting. Then we will prepare bid documents. Once that is done, it comes back to the council again for award of contract. For first reading in the vote. Yes, so the two, two times in front of the council for the award of contract. Okay. Well, I didn't hear any disagreement, so I think there you go. Thank you, that ends our manager's report tonight, Mayor. Right. Thank you, and appreciate all the uh, comments and input from the neighbors in the Clyde Estates subdivision. That brings us to item 12, attorney's report. Madam Attorney, Ms. Petrarca, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Only one item to present this evening. That is an ordinance adopting the State of Illinois Plumbing Code and amendments thereto. They will appear on next week's active agenda. Thank you. That brings us to item 13, public comments. This is the opportunity for members of the audience to share with the council uh, any questions or comments of a general nature with respect to items not on tonight's agenda. Questions or comments of a general nature. Good evening. Good evening. Andy Hebert, Maple Avenue. Um, I'm sure like many of you, I was watching the Restaurant Impossible episode. And I have to say, I was very saddened how our town came off with our building codes. Robert Irvine was understandably upset. And I know a lot of other business owners have been upset about the very strict, difficult task they had with opening their businesses. And I, I just would implore the council to please look into that. Make our, make our town actually business friendly. I mean, I know that's a big, big issue with the council, and it should be. Business helps everybody, so make it, make it easy for people to open businesses. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Heber. Two things, one, I agree with you, we absolutely should be business friendly and, and continue to uh, facilitate our model of being facilitators, not regulators, as much as possible, because obviously a vibrant economic environment in Downers Grove helps everybody. Uh, so we absolutely are of that mentality. Yet, as you saw, there are some codes that get adopted that we don't have a lot of choice with. Uh, second of all, the Restaurant Impossible episode in itself, you're not the first one that has shared some concern with us about the dramatization that was on the program. Uh, if I can just remind everyone, it is entertainment. It's a TV show, and the name of the show is Restaurant Impossible, so the mission has to seem impossible, otherwise it's not much of a show. Uh, this time, they didn't have bad food to complain about. They didn't have other things to complain about. So one of the things that they had to create for some drama on the show uh, was the evil building inspectors uh, that were characterized on the show. Um, the actual owners of the business have since spoken out about that and have discounted that perception. And so the actual owners, uh, Mr. Black and Mr. Canning, have spoken directly to this. There's a video that's on the Village Facebook page that talks about how actually the producers of the show were very complimentary with working with the Village. Uh, it was based on show business. Well, I, I've seen some other business owners comment on Facebook about their, uh, their experiences being very similar, though. I've seen some of those, too. And obviously, those situations, we'd have to look at what it was that was their, cir their circumstances. Uh, it was a straight comment about, I didn't have a good experience with the village. It's hard for me to assess whether what's behind that without knowing the full story. In this particular instance, because it was raised and then we looked into it because we had a specific business with specific people, uh, we were able to assess the situation. And, and in this case, it was, it was more of the entertainment value than anything else. Yeah, but, but you're absolutely right. Every time any business raises an issue about their interaction with our building department or code services, uh, we always strive for a business-friendly outcome. Good. So thank you for your comments. Other questions or comments of a general nature? <coughs> Good evening, uh, Mayor Tully. Good evening. Commissioners. I'm Gordon Goodman. I live at 5834 Middaw. And I wanted to 
extend an invitation to you to help us uh, celebrate the coming of spring 2015. Pierce Downers Heritage Alliance had... And that comes in about August in this part of the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're hoping for May 2nd, actually, this year. We've got an order in for good weather on May 2nd. Uh, we had a walk in uh, Lyman Woods uh, last year, May 3rd, and it turned out quite nice. So we thought, again, uh, May 2nd was a good guess of spring. And uh, we're... Uh, very pleased that Lance Henning, Henning, who is a, a wonderful naturalist and uh, volunteer at the Lyman Woods Interpretive Center, has agreed again to lead parties of uh, approximately 12 walkers uh, to uh, explore the urban wilderness we have in Lyman Woods and appreciate the wildflowers. So. Uh, we hope that you and uh, other members of the community will go to the uh, Pierce Downers website and register for this walk. We're using it as a fundraiser and uh, uh, hoping that people are willing to donate $25 per person uh, to walk with this uh, wonderful guide. And uh, if they want to bring along their youngsters who are uh, 12 or under, uh, they can come without making a donation. So we hope it'll be a nice family day and there'll be refreshments after the walks. Uh, one walk is at 10 o'clock and the second walk is at 1 in the afternoon and uh, walkers should expect to spend about an hour and three quarters exploring Lyman Woods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for extending that invitation. There's good wishes for good weather. <coughs> Hello again. Hi. Ronald Bowen, 829 Clyde Drive. Um, back to stormwater. Um, I noticed in here in your staff report that was on the um, agenda table, that it wasn't gone through tonight, so I don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, it's there's a... Um, contract here that's going to be given to a company for uh, St. Joe's Creek. And I question why it's just from Carpenter West when St. Joe's Creek really needs work east of there uh, where Webster, Lyman, and Washington, uh, east of Main Street. I wonder why that's not part of this because that's in real bad shape. And that's where it flooded in the late 80s, where the village was uh, bought three properties to mitigate for the flooding down at the bottom of the hill where the uh, creek goes, goes under the roads. So I'm questioning that. And I also want to uh, also go back to uh, when we spoke about water quality. <clears throat> uh, the village has paid for these bookmarkers, which are out by the front desk. And I thought it was interesting that uh, these are different ways to keep runoff pollution from occurring, but salt isn't part of that list. And I have a real concern about that. And you also have on this staff report, rock salt as one of the um, contracts you're letting out. And I'd like to be part of your salt policy uh, meeting the next time you hold that, because I think that's, a, that's an issue. And that is also a road corroser, corroser. It corroses, it's corrosive to asphalt and concrete, and that's a big problem we have in our village that no one addressed tonight either. Everybody's talking about water, but salt is a big, <laughs> has a big effect on our road, and with such little traffic in Clyde Estates, it doesn't need to be piled, and, and that goes into our yards and into the, water system, the watershed. I also uh, asked for a couple hydrology studies uh, that related to the Clyde Estates uh, stormwater issue and was told there were none and yet everything that's come out uh, in this report that you provided for tonight's uh, meeting is has referred to stormwater calculations and I just wonder where those stormwater calculations came from if we had no study to refer to. So before we d dig ditches and put a big hole in the ground with tall grass, uh, maybe we ought to have that released to the public because somebody has the report if they have calculations that came from a report. Thank you very much for getting back to me about that. 
Thank you, Ms. Bowen. Other questions or comments of a general nature? Welcome back, sir. John Plifka, 6016 Washington. I know you don't approve of singling out one individual up here, uh, but in the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing research, and this concerns you, Mayor Tully. Uh, you made a statement several weeks ago, and I'm going to look up that statement, that if you were sitting up here in one year, you would be uh, removing your hair for St. Baldrick's Day. I think I did say that. <laughs> I will be diligently studying YouTube. I don't think Video. I need to look it up. I'm pretty sure I said that. <laughs> so far, I've raised 52 cents to help you. <laughs> well, we got to do better than that. That's a very good cause. Thank you. I'm glad to see people are listening. <laughs> That's the important thing. Any other questions or comments of a general nature? Are you going to shave your head? St. Baldrick's. <laughs> I might just have to wager on that. <laughs> See him after the meeting. Uh, the hearing none, then that brings us to item 14, which is reserved for council member new business. Do any items, uh, I'm not sorry, any members of the village council have any items of new business they would like to raise at the council? Commissioner Barnett. Thank you, Mayor. I have two. Um, first one, these are in keeping kind of with our policy. This is just a first brush. Uh, at notice to folks that, that uh, I'd like to be working on these in the near, very near future. Um, first one has to do with historic preservation. As we probably all recall, we are uh, likely this summer reviewing and considering our historic preservation ordinance, um, trying to find ways to improve its effectiveness. Um, it, it's got certainly some elements that we're all proud of, yet it's um, actual effect on historic preservation has been pretty minimal um, in its seven years or so. And so one of the things I'd like us to be talking about, and I'll, I'll be bringing some more information to my colleagues on, is finding ways to incentivize um, folks to want to participate voluntarily. And so things along the lines of um, matching fees or matching funds, and, and the general premise would be I'd like to look for some sources for revenue. Maybe they are developer fees, maybe there are new construction fees, maybe there are demolition permit fees, um, things along those lines that would be put into a fund for historic preservation. And the idea would be if people um, were willing to take that step and privately go ahead and, and put their house into a preserved mode, the village would have some resources available, not from general funds, to perhaps help them um, with improvements or maintenance. So it'd be, you know, for example, this is certainly not the plan, but if you were willing to do this, perhaps we would match up to $5,000. Somebody could do $10,000 worth of exterior maintenance and improvements as they put their property into protection and get some help from us in doing that. Um, I don't know exactly what the causes have been, um, but we have talked a lot over the last certainly five and a half years um, about how important historic preservation is and we're just not doing it as a community. And so I'd like us to be talking about this piece of it beyond whatever changes to the existing ordinance we might anticipate. Um, and so I'll, I'll present some more information to everybody on that. I'd like folks to start thinking along those lines. Um, secondly is uh, tree preservation. We, we visited this. Mayor, you can help me because it was when you were up here as a council person. So February 12, 2008. There you go. Thank you. Um, and largely took the step of, um, of not doing a lot to pre preserve private trees. And so again, in the, uh, along the lines of trying to find some way to incentivize and create an environment um, where folks want to do what we hope everybody wants to do, which is do their best to preserve trees, I'd like us to look at revisiting that ordinance and, and trying to recognize the public value of private trees. Um, so some ways you might do that. Um, one is a carrot, I guess, and one is a stick, if you will, um, at least the ideas that I have. One is that we would permit the removal of trees and engage our forester. And so if a tree was um, viable um, but for the homeowner's just desire to not have it there, um, there would perhaps be a fee associated with removal. If, it, if forester de deemed a tree diseased or dangerous to the home, any other number of things, a person could remove it without any penalty. Um, I think that's important to do. Um, but then also, I'd like to find a way to sort of take the village's uh, participation in our, in our tree consortium and our movement towards communication and 
cause our residents to be able to in some way, and I don't know what this way looks like exactly, but participate in a far heavier mode, a far more active mode in the uh, accessing the opportunity to purchase trees at discounted rates uh, beyond the parkway. Uh, right now, we, uh, I think we're missing an opportunity for residents to um, do the things that we talk about being important in the community because there's barriers. There's, there's barriers to cost. There's barriers to understanding what to do. There's barriers, if you were going to pick a tree, what would you pick? Where would you put it? Um, involvement with our really top drawer forestry program um, in some more intentional form uh, might go a long ways towards helping over the period of time really building canopy beyond just the parkways that we manage. So none of that, of course, is, is ordinance ready uh, or even close. Um, but I'd like to just give everybody sort of the heads up that those are issues that I'm going to be uh, providing my colleagues and my new colleagues with additional information on in the near future and hope that we'll keep on our, uh, an agenda sometime not too far down the road. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. look forward to both those things. Just to add to what you said about tree preservation, uh, it was in February 2008, last time the Council seriously discussed a tree preservation ordinance. Uh, there was a, a presentation made by staff on February 12, 2008. There was a workshop discussion by the Council at that time on February 26th. And on, it, it, there was a fair amount of information that was provided because the Environmental <coughs> Concerns Commission had worked up an actual ordinance that was recommended to the Village Council for adoption by a vote of four to one. And there were various aspects of that. Uh, it was also in, I don't want to say influence, but there was, it also had the benefit of a fair amount of information from the Morton Arboretum, which was mentioned here earlier tonight. And at the time, it, it didn't, for lack of a better word, grow any roots. Um, but there's a fair amount of, of history there that for both uh, our benefit as well as uh, those who will be joining the council for their benefit, there's some history on this that we should all re refresh ourselves on. And I, I know that you will bring that forward as well as part of a base of what you propose. Um, I also seem to recall that in um, the uh, TCD3 report, there was a reference to uh, some kind of a tree preservation ordinance. So we should remind ourselves of that too, as one of our community planning documents actually mentioning this topic as well. The third thing I'll mention is something that is a, a practical matter often comes up and speaking of the carrot and stick approach is I do recall if I'm correct me if I'm wrong uh, there was some there was a uh, proposal at one point in time that to incentivize developers not just with fines if you destroy trees but actually giving them something that would encourage them to preserve trees when they redevelop property uh, the challenge was that the, the tree actually would have to survive for a while because, as you know, sometimes there can be excavation that's done and it damages the tree roots and you don't, the tree lives for two years and then it dies. Uh, and by that point in time, all the interested parties are long gone. Uh, so one of the challenges is how do we uh, use the carrot and stick approach in that regard uh, in a way that actually guarantees that the tree will survive for some meaningful period of time. So again, not suggesting that that's an insurmountable obstacle, just something that I'm just sharing with you as something I remembered from the time that uh, and whatever we consider, we should probably um, include that as consideration, how to solve that issue. To be sure. All right. But look forward to seeing you bring that forward, or staff bring it forward with your, with your cooperation. Thank you. Commissioner Jose. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is less a, a new business and more of an old business, I suppose. And I'm not really looking for any action. But um, I, we, uh, as you might have heard, had an election uh, last week, and as is been famously said elections have consequences um, one of the issues in that campaign was the Edwards house and, and how to uh, go about addressing that issue um, the uh, the folks who were elected to the council uh, and then will be taking office next month uh, had a, a different view on how to uh, approach that problem and uh, I would just like to see it come before the reconstituted council at some point uh, provided the issue is not already taken care of by them. Uh, I think it's important that the community have the benefit of their input, uh, their perspective, uh, given that uh, so many people came out and expressed that through the ballot box. So, just wanted to throw that out there. An interesting suggestion. I, I understand where you're coming from. I, well, I guess we'll have to see how circumstances play out because it may not be, there may not be time. Understood. Understood. So, you throw it out there. There it is. Are you implying that this could be something we vote on next week? What we look at next week? Uh, no, that's not what Commissioner Jose was suggesting. He was actually talking about the 2015-2017 uh, the, the, the council addressing it. Correct. Right, so that wouldn't be next week. 
it's my understanding that you said that there may be things that were prevented by it on a time basis. No, I'm just saying there may not there may not be a need to well my I, I don't know. My point is I don't know the circumstances may dictate the course of actions in terms of things beyond our control. I don't know. Correct. But I, I understand your point. I concur. I think that's an excellent idea. If at all possible. Yeah, I, I don't know if it is. That's what I was getting at. Right. Yeah. I just don't know. Other new items of new business, any members of the council? I'm hearing none. I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Newstead. Aye. Commissioner Durkin. Aye. Commissioner Hussain.